This video is brought to you by World of Warships. You're a movie, Ian. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier, and I'm here at the Naval Museum of Manitoba at HMCS Chippewa in Winnipeg, having a look at an enormous Maxim gun. This is a QF two-pounder Mark VIII, usually known by its nickname, the pom-pom. And this was the most common type of close-in air defense weapon used by the Royal Navy and other British Commonwealth navies during the Second World War. And this despite the fact that by the time the war broke out, these types of guns were already becoming somewhat obsolete. But before we dive into the fascinating history of the pom-pom, first a word from this video sponsor, World of Warships. World of Warships is a free-to-play online game that lets you take command of some of history's most iconic warships. Choose from over 600 battleships, cruisers, destroyers, aircraft carriers, and submarines, from the legendary Yamato, Tirpitz, Iowa, and Dreadnought, to the more obscure Rio de Janeiro, Viterbis Unitas, and Mogador. Each ship is lovingly recreated down to the last detail, with key stats like top speed, turning radius, armor protection, and the time needed to aim and reload the guns accurately represented. Battle against a massive online community in more than 40 highly detailed maps with stunning water and weather effects that put you right in the heart of the action. With each victory, you unlock ever more powerful ships, allowing you to dominate the high seas. And with new content released every month, including in-game nations, ship classes, or themed maps like Transformers, Popeye, or Godzilla vs. Kong, there's always something exciting to look forward to. From November 16th to 30th, players can participate in a special in-game collaboration event between World of Warships and the popular anime High School Fleet. At registration, use the promo code HSF2023 to receive a huge starter pack including 200 doubloons, 1 million credits, 7 days of premium account time, and 2 high school fleet commanders. Link in the description. Oh, and did I mention World of Warships is also available on console? Now, I don't normally play a lot of video games, but even I have to say World of Warships is a ton of fun, and I love the sheer variety of historical warships that you get to play. So, what are you waiting for? Like Nelson, I expect that every viewer will do their duty. So the story of the pom-pom begins in the 1880s when Sir Hiram Maxim, the inventor of the first modern successful machine gun, scaled up his design to fire a 400 gram 37 millimeter projectile, creating the Maxim Nordenfeldt one pounder QF. And this weight of projectile was very deliberately chosen because it was the minimum for an explosive round permitted by the 1868 St. Petersburg Declaration and the 1899 Hague Convention. And these came about because it was thought that using exploding or fulminating bullets against individual soldiers on the battlefield was unnecessarily cruel. And so by international agreement, these types of munitions were restricted to larger caliber guns that would be used against fortifications, torpedo boats out at sea, that sort of thing. Now, the Maxim Nordenfeldt one-pounder had a cyclic rate of 100 rounds per minute and fed from a 25-round cloth belt and they were purchased or built under license by a variety of nations, including Belgium, Finland, Germany, the United States, Paraguay, and Bolivia. And interestingly enough, the British initially rejected this gun, but very quickly changed their mind when they found themselves on the receiving end of its enormous firepower during the Boer War. And indeed, it was during the Boer War that this acquired its iconic nickname of pom-pom, which came from the distinctive sound it made while firing. Now, in 1900, the British Vickers company acquired Maxim Nordenfeldt and thus became the primary manufacturer of the One Pounder. Now, at the beginning of the First World War, Vickers produced a further upscaled version of the Maxim Nordenfeldt One Pounder called the QF One and a Half Pounder Mark I. And this is intended for use not only against torpedo boats and other small vessels by the Navy, but also for use against aircraft, which are becoming increasingly prevalent in modern warfare. But while these guns were extensively tested aboard the cruisers HMS Arethusa and Undaunted, they never went into service, being immediately superseded by an even larger version called the QF Two Pounder Mark II. And this was ordered specifically in 1915 for use against aircraft and included a number of advanced features, including time delay shells with an integral fuse setter that would set the range on the shell prior to firing. 
Unfortunately, however, this gun suffered from a number of problems, and this mainly stemmed from the fact that scaling up the Maxim design resulted in a structure that was far too light for the recoil of the shell that it was firing. So these guns tended to suffer from warpage and breakage or even shells falling out of the belts. And these were progressively addressed over the course of the war, culminating in the final version, the Mark II C Star, which among other things introduced a metallic link belt for the ammunition, which was far more reliable than the older cloth belt. However, one problem that was never solved during the First World War was that of muzzle velocity. Uh, due to the small size of the shell and the short barrel on the two-pounder, the muzzle velocity was only around 2,000 feet per second. And as aircraft started flying higher and faster, it became increasingly difficult for the two-pounder to successfully engage them. However, 7,000 of these guns were manufactured during the war, and they were fitted to all sorts of Royal Navy vessels smaller than a cruiser, and purchased by several Allied nations, including Imperial Russia and Italy. And at the beginning of the Second World War, all remaining guns in inventory were taken out of storage and placed aboard smaller auxiliary vessels like armed trawlers and yachts in order to free up more modern weapons for more strategically vital ships. Though by 1944, almost all of these guns had been scrapped. Now, in the 1920s, as the performance of aircraft, particularly naval torpedo and dive bombers, continued to improve, the Royal Navy realized that it needed a more advanced close-in aerial defense system. And while several companies submitted designs, eventually the Navy went with the Vickers design, which was an improved version of the two-pounder Mark II. And this decision was mainly made because it would allow the Navy to make use of the vast stocks of two-pounder ammunition that it had left over from the First World War. So development of what would become the QF two-pounder Mark VIII, like the one we have here, began in 1923, though due to a lack of funding that afflicted pretty much all armed services around the world during this period, sea trials didn't begin until 1927-1928, and the guns didn't start being installed aboard Royal Navy ships until 1930. So the Mark VIII had a cyclic rate of 115 rounds per minute, though in practice, for reasons that we'll discuss a little bit later, this was usually reduced down to 97 rounds per minute. And a number of different mountings were developed for these guns. There were two different types of single mountings. There was the Mark VIII, which was a manually operated mounting, and the Mark XVI, which was a powered single mounting. There was the Mark VII quadruple mounting, and finally, and probably the most famous, the Mark V and Mark VI octuple mounting, also known as the Chicago Piano. Though this name was derived from a similar American weapon, the 1.1 inch 75 caliber gun, and was a reference to the nickname of the Thompson submachine gun, Chicago Typewriter, as well as to the enormous size of the mounting. Now, on the octuple mounting, the guns were arranged in two rows of four, and to ensure that the feed mechanisms aligned with one another, these guns were made in both left, right, and inner and outer variants. Now, these fed from a 14-round metallic link belt, which of course doesn't give you a whole lot of firing time, but the various mounts came equipped with a special tray that allowed several belts to be stacked one on top of another. So the single mounts could stack four belts, the quadruple mounts could stack eight belts, and the octuple mounts could stack 10 belts for 140 rounds or 73 seconds of continuous firing per gun. Though, of course, under actual combat conditions, you would have a large gun crew dedicated to keeping the belts replenished, which would allow you to sustain fire for much longer periods. So one problem that was anticipated early in the development process was that if all the guns in a multiple mounting were allowed to fire at their regular cyclic rates, these rates would differ slightly from one another, and this could lead to a great deal of vibration or unbalanced forces, which could put unwanted stresses on the gun mount. And so these mounts were fitted with a synchronization mechanism whereby the guns would be put into semi-automatic mode and would be fired in a certain sequence by a motor-driven cam system. Though this would actually bring down the cyclic rate to 97 rounds per minute. However, in 1939, it was realized that this was more of a problem with the quadruple mounts, and so the synchronization mechanism was rarely used for the octuple mounts for the rest of these guns' service lives. Another problem with earlier versions of this gun that was addressed just before the start of the Second World War was the problem of low-velocity ammunition. So in 1938, a new high-velocity shell was introduced, 
that increased the muzzle velocity from 2,000 feet per second to 2,400 feet per second. And this required retrofitting of some of the older mounts in order to take the greater recoil of the new shell. And these older mounts that were retrofitted in this manner were designated in the British style with a star or asterisk. Now, interestingly enough, the United States Navy actually seriously considered adopting the QF two pounder Mark VIII as its official short range anti aircraft gun. And after considering a whole bunch of options, the decision came down to the two pounder and the 40 millimeter Bofors gun from Sweden. And ultimately, the US Navy decided on the Bofors for two main reasons. Number one, the shells for the two pounder used cordite propellant, which the United States wasn't equipped to manufacture. And it was found, unfortunately, that the shells could not be adapted to American propellant powders. And second was the old bugbear of muzzle velocity, because even with the new high velocity shells, the muzzle velocity of the two pounder was still 400 feet per second slower than the Bofors gun. Now, while the two pounder was an advanced weapon when it entered service in 1930, by the time the Second World War broke out, it was starting to become somewhat obsolescent. And this really had nothing to do with the gun itself, which was found to be very reliable. For example, in January 1941, during one of the convoy missions to resupply Malta, HMS Illustrious's two pounder batteries fired some 30,000 shells continuously with very few stoppages. The problem was with the ammunition as well as with the fire control systems, which at that time were too slow and inaccurate to keep up with modern aircraft. But this problem was largely solved in 1941 with the introduction of the Mark IV fired control system. And this used an advanced analog computer called the Gyro Rate Unit Box, or GRUB, as well as the Type 282 radar for targeting. Now, I would love to do a full video on Naval Fire Director systems because they are absolutely fascinating pieces of technology. But in summary, the crew of the director, which was positioned separate from the guns, typically up in the superstructure of a ship for a clearer view, would track an aircraft. And this data would be transmitted to the computer, which would calculate the proper deflection and would translate the position of the aircraft relative to whatever gun was firing at it. And in the earlier Mark 1, 2, and 3 versions of the two-pounder gun director, the data from the computer would move what was known as a follow the pointer system, which was an indicator inside the gun mount that the crew would then have to align the guns with. So then they really didn't have to aim at the aircraft, they just had to follow the directions from the gun director. The Mark IV version, however, introduced direct control, where moving the director and tracking an aircraft would automatically move the gun mount. So then all the gun crew had to do was keep the gun loaded with ammunition and firing. Yet despite these technical improvements, there were still major flaws with the two-pounder gun system, as became apparent on December 10, 1941, when Z-Force, comprising HMS Prince of Wales and HMS Repulse, were attacked and sunk by Japanese aircraft near Singapore. And despite being armed collectively with no fewer than seven two-pounder octuple mountings, the two ships were only able to shoot down four and damage a handful of other Japanese aircraft before being sunk. And a report on the action claimed that a single 40 millimeter Bofors would have been far more effective than all those two-pounder batteries, though that particular claim has not really been substantiated. Now, on the one hand, if you consider the terrific onslaught that these ships were up against, their fate was pretty much inevitable. However, it was probably hastened somewhat by the problems they had with their anti-aircraft batteries. For example, they had a lot of problems with the ammunition, which was all left over from the First World War and had degraded badly in storage, particularly in the tropical heat and humidity around Singapore. And this led to a lot of misfires. Also, the ammunition didn't have tracer capability, which seriously undermined their deterrent effect. If you are a Japanese pilot coming in for an attack and you can't see how many shells are being lobbed at you, which you could if they were firing tracers, then you have very little incentive to break off your attack. And finally, there were problems with the Type 282 radar, which tended to fail in tropical heat and humidity. But again, most of these problems were gradually solved over the course of the war. And indeed, in that very same year, 1941, a new tracer shell was introduced, as well as an armor-piercing shell. And this greatly improved the performance of the guns going forward. And it was these technical improvements that really allowed this somewhat obsolescent gun to continue in service and serve with distinction 
for the rest of the war. Now, another major factor in these guns' longevity, which is often ignored when talking about procurement and use of weapons in wartime, was simply their sheer availability. While they were certainly more advanced, guns like the 40mm Bofors were always in short supply, whereas large numbers of two-pounders were always available. And so until the end of the war, these outnumbered other types of similar guns in Royal Navy and Commonwealth use by almost two to one. And the number of two-pounder mountings on ships only went up throughout the war, with the King George V class having no fewer than eight octuple mountings. Now, later in the war, one of the tasks that these guns were found to be very good at was engaging Japanese kamikaze aircraft at short range, since these could lay down a devastating wall of high explosives very quickly. And indeed, the advent of kamikazes led to a sort of renaissance for the by then rather obsolete single mountings, as they were found to be far more effective than the 20mm Orlikan cannon and far more available than the 40mm Bofors. And so the development and use of the two-pounder Mark VIII pom-pom is really an interesting underdog story where a gun that was somewhat obsolescent at the start of the war was able to soldier on through the rest of the war and serve with distinction thanks to A, its sheer availability, and B, gradual technical upgrades throughout the course of the war. And indeed, these remained in service aboard Royal Navy, Royal Australian Navy, and Dutch Navy ships until the 1950s. Right, so let's have a closer look at this particular gun. Like I said at the beginning, this is essentially an upscaled Maxim gun, its lineage going all the way back to the Maxim Nordenfeldt one-pounder of the 1880s. And so this has a short recoil system where when it fires, the barrel is going to reciprocate back. And then you have a toggle lock system where normally the toggle is locked in the forward position. But as it moves back with the barrel, it goes over a cam and starts to bend. And this unlocks it and allows the action to cycle. Right, so starting at the rear of the weapon, we have our charging handle, which is currently in the stowed position. To unlock this, you slide this little block to the side, then the handle drops down, and then to cock the mechanism, you simply turn this to the left. Now, right above it is a round counter, and this can be reset using this little wheel to the side, as you can see here. Now, something interesting to note about this particular gun is that, according to the staff here, this came off of a single mounting on a flower class Corvette. However, as you'll see at the rear here, there is a big number three cast into the brass of the receiver. And this would indicate that this is actually off of a multiple mounting, either a quad or an octuple mounting. As I said at the beginning of the video, these guns were manufactured in both left hand, right hand, and inner and outer variants so that their feed mechanisms would line up within a multiple mounting. Right, so we can open the top cover here. We just push in this latch and hinge that forward. This is all made of very heavy duty brass, which is corrosion resistant for use out at sea. And if we look forward into the receiver, we'll see the toggle lock mechanism, which is derived from the original Maxim design. And if we look straight down, we can see that the charging handle is connected to a combination of worm gear and rack and pinion gear. And this allows the action both to be cocked when the charging handle is turned and also to cycle freely under recoil. So this whole brass block here can actually slide rearwards to provide greater access to the internals. And one of the ways you unlock that is by rotating this pin in the back. It's got a little keyway on it and pulling it out. However, I can't actually open this because there's another locking pin here that is threaded and has a locking nut on the end. I really don't want to mess with that. This is, after all, a museum display. Now, moving forward, we have our safety lever, which has two positions, fire and safe. So here we have our water cooling jacket with the inlet and the outlet at the rear. And this would have been very easy to supply with large quantities of cold water aboard a ship, which allowed for long periods of sustained fire. And finally, we have our distinctive flash hider. And this is to protect the vision of gunners when these were being used at night. And that's pretty much all I can show you on this particular gun. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching and a huge shout out to the Naval Museum of Manitoba for allowing me to film their amazing collection and to World of Warships for sponsoring this video. I'll see you next time on another video where we'll have a look at yet more fascinating ordnance and other devices just like this one. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.